So this morning and this evening, you might say today is a, a day of identification because it just so happens that this morning and tonight, uh, I want to do uh, lessons related to two very powerful beings uh, that unfortunately sometimes we know very little about. Uh, we need to know more about them. Uh, tonight I want to talk about Satan, about who he is, about uh, why he uh, does what he does, how he came to be and what exactly uh, we're up against. And, and that's something we need to know. And this morning, though, uh, for this lesson, I'm going to talk about the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Holy Spirit is, uh, is, is part of the Godhead. He is certainly a He and not an It. But if we're real honest with ourselves, the Holy Spirit is probably the part of the Godhead that we are furthest from, if you will. Uh, we know about God the Father. We know that He is God, a God of hope, a God of love, a God of mercy a God of justice, or justice, a God of righteousness. We know about how He was, His law, His teachings, how He treated those in the patriarchal dispensation, how He acted, how He behaved, how He uh, commanded, the laws that He gave in the Mosaical dispensation, and how He is even today in His providence. And, and we know about Jesus and how uh, Christ came to this uh, earth and uh, how He is a, a Christ of love. Even back in the Old Testament, we really see Him ultimately in the burning bush, claiming to be God, knowing that that must have been God the Son. And when He appeared before Joshua and accepted worship, that angel of the Lord apparently being Christ there. But what about the Spirit? If you were to take a, a, a piece of paper out and to write a, a paper, a document on God the Father, you could do that. We could do that on Jesus the Son. But what about the Spirit? What would you write down? Uh, on that document. Would you say maybe that uh, He's always been, He is God? Uh, you might say that He was involved with the miracles, the indwelling of the apostles and in the miraculous age, but what else would you say? But maybe that He brought the Bible to us, but, but outside of those facts, uh, we, little, we really don't know a whole lot of the Spirit like we are. I'm going to start with the most fundamental of this, the most obvious by way of introduction, and that is that He is God. And there are a number of ways that we know that, but there are a number of ways we can prove it as well biblically. For example, we could talk about the Trinity. Matthew 28 uh, is an example, verse 19. After Jesus tells the apostles, All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things. So he's part of that Godhead, that Trinity. And so from that alone, we can know that he is God. But more than that, we can notice his characteristics, uh, characteristics of deity, only that which deity possesses. For example, he is eternal. Hebrews 9 and verse 14, only God, only deity is eternal. And the Spirit himself is mentioned as being eternal in Hebrews 9, 14. Christ purging in, uh, us through his blood uh, and it says there, through His eternal Spirit. But maybe the best example of all, if you have your Bibles, meet me in Acts chapter 5. We have a place in our Bibles that will just uh, come out and say and call Him God. He is absolutely God. Acts chapter 5. Now you remember, at Pentecost, obviously these, uh, these people, they had no idea what they were about to partake of, to experience in becoming Christians. And, and they stayed in Jerusalem, as you recall. And they worshiped together. And because of that, they didn't have all the funds that they needed. And so they began to sell uh, their goods, sell their land, and to, uh, to get that money distributed out to one another so that they could be together longer. What a beautiful uh, picture there. But in Acts chapter 5, after, right after, by the way, we see Barnabas giving his land, selling it, giving all the money to the brethren. You remember Ananias and Sapphira. They sold their land. They wanted the credit for doing good but they weren't willing to, to really do uh, what the other brethren were willing to do. In fact, they lied about it. They, they knew that they weren't giving all that money, but they were pretending like they did. And so in verse 3, Peter addresses them, and he says this, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto me, and notice, but unto God. You've lied to the Holy Spirit, verse 3. You've lied to God, verse 4. The Holy Spirit referenced there as God Almighty. We're going to talk more about uh, how He hurt the Spirit. Let me introduce a couple more thoughts here. 
I got to thinking about why is it that we're farther from the Spirit than God the Father or God the Son? Why is it that we don't talk about the Spirit as much or really understand Him as much? A couple of thoughts. One, I think it's because He is so contra- controversial. We don't like as, as individuals most of the time things that are controversial. There's, even in the Lord's body, there's a debate, especially when it comes to the, the gift of the Spirit and how the Spirit works today. and Does He indwell us? Does He not indwell us? Is it literal? Is it figurative? All of these questions that come up, and so we just kind of say, I don't, I don't want to deal with that. I, I, don't, I don't really understand Him, and so I, I don't really want to, uh, to talk about Him. Right? It's a lack of understanding. And I wonder if, if it's almost like some don't... Uh, they're almost they're disappointed, you might say. You know, there was a time in the first century when, uh, when they were performing miracles that the Holy Spirit would give them, and, and now we can't, we can't do that today. And, and so what, what's His real purpose? And He already gave us the Bible. I mean, here it is. So, so what's going on today? How is the Spirit working, and why would that be significant anyways? But lastly, I think this is another thought to consider. Have you ever, have you ever thought about how you would picture the Holy Spirit and King James Version, I love King James Version, I preach from it, but, uh, but sometimes it references Him as the Holy Ghost. And that really doesn't help when it comes to picturing the Spirit. We picture God the Father, and, and, and what it is to be a Father, and there's, there's plenty of imagery for God. And of course, Jesus the Christ, we have depictions of Him all over the place, on the cross especially, and, and who He is, and we picture Him. When we partake of the Lord's Supper, we, we envision Him in our minds, at least we ought to. But what do we picture when we think of the Spirit? Right? What comes to mind? How do you do you picture a a ghost that's just kind of there, that's floating? I mean, what what does he envision to you? What do you see when you think of the Holy Spirit? And so, for all of those reasons, I think we just we just kind of push him to the side and and don't really study him as we do the others. Let me give you five things, time permitting. Five things or five aspects or characteristics of the Spirit that you know about him. And what you're going to see is, is He is very much God. Just like God the Father and God the Son have these attributes, so does He. First of all, He has a, a mind. It talks about knowing the mind of the Spirit. He that searches the heart knows the mind of the Spirit. Now what does that mean? Well, I think often when we think of the Spirit, we picture Him as basically God-controlled. As if God the Father was kind of telling him what to do and, and speaking through him and, and inspiring men based upon what God tells him to do. And, and there's some pictures of that, just like with Christ. But, but the Spirit himself has his own mind. Again, these are three distinct entities. They have the same mind, in essence, in that they are absolutely unified in everything that is going on in their minds. But they do each have a mind, if that makes sense. That's hard to really have our minds around, isn't it? He does have a mind. Look at 1 Corinthians 2 with 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Just a, a, an interesting perspective on this, I believe. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 9, beginning. You're familiar with this passage, but as it is written, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Right? That we, we can't even truly picture, imagine, think of here uh, what's going to come. Not only in the kingdom here, the church on earth, but, but ultimately in heaven. But look at verse 10. But God, there's that contrast, but God hath revealed them unto us. We can learn some of these things. We can know some of these things because of or through, notice, His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. As I was doing this study, I, I, I was reading this and, and thinking about how this is depicted as the Spirit who knows God the Father. And the Spirit, uh, being God, He knows Him better than any of us could, and He gives us that knowledge as much as He wills. Verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of a man save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. We learn about God the Father. We learn about God the Son and God the Spirit, of course, through the teachings of the Spirit, through this, of course. And so the mind of the Spirit gives us that information. But look at chapter 12, a few chapters over. He has his mind. He has his own intellect, if you will. 
but he also has his own will. And of course, that will lines up with God the Father and God the Son. Don't mistake that either. Verse 10, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 10, talking about these miracles. To another, he's given these gifts. The miracles uh, to another prophecy, to another concerning of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But notice this verse. But all these worketh that one and the safe, uh, selfsame spirit dividing to every man severally as he will. As the Spirit desires, right? As His will is there. He has His own mind. He has His own will. And again, I'm not saying it's different than the mind of God or the mind of Christ, but He's not some ghost, robotic ghost, if you will, that's just being controlled. He is God. He does have His own mind, His own will, His own intellect. And through that mind, we have these Scriptures. Now let's build on this. Not only does he have his own mind, his own will, but he is a teacher. Again, we know that's true of, say, Jesus Christ. John 3. Remember when Nicodemus came to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. No man could do these miracles except he be from God. We know that about Christ, but what about the Spirit? We need to understand that he too is a teacher. Look at John 14. John 14. I know this is very fundamental, but I want to to add a thought or two to this that, that maybe you, you have or haven't considered. John 14, verse 26. John 14, 26. I love hearing those pages being turned. Jesus is, is telling His apostles here that He's going to leave. He's going to depart. He's going to die and to leave this world and ascend back to heaven. But, verse 26. Here's the, the, the comforting, literally, information. But the comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, He shall teach you all things, and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. We think of Christ as a teacher because we see Him physically on earth at a time reading in the Scriptures, and we see Him teaching. But with the Spirit, we may not always think about Him that way because we don't really see Him verbally expressing himself, outside of maybe Philip telling him to go join himself to the, to the eunuch, to the chariot. And so the Spirit himself does teach, right? 1 Timothy 4.1, he speaks, he expresses himself. But we don't always think about it that way. But I love this word comforter, and here's why. Let's go over two chapters to chapter 16. He's not just a teacher. You, you've been to school. We've all had classes of some sort. Uh, maybe it was uh, further uh, back for some of us than others, but you remember a time when you were sitting in a classroom and you had a teacher, and you remember some differences in those teachers. You remember the difference between a teacher who would simply stand up there and tell you what you needed to know and that was it, versus a teacher who was willing to spend that one-on-one -on -one time with you, to advise you, to counsel you, to guide you. Look at the, the way this is worded in John 16, 13. He's more than just a teacher. Notice, howbeit, when He, the Spirit of truth, is come, He will guide you into all truth. That word guide there is, is more than just teach. It's more than just letting them know. It's, a, it's that sense of comfort. It's that sense of a, a personal one-on-one -on -one time, in a sense, that allows the, the Spirit to teach them as individuals, to remind them what they were taught as individuals, and to see them through it, to always be there with them. Right? You, you hear a teacher say, my office is always open, and I'll always be here if you need to, to come in and see me in my office. Well, it's not telling them they have to come to his office. He's always there with them, following them around, if you will, within them, working in them, teaching them, reminding them. Not only that, but he is uh, a teacher, a guide of precision. Every teacher is human, at least here on earth, and, and so teachers make mistakes. Sometimes they'll teach something that maybe isn't completely accurate, and sometimes... Especially in today's society, we have teachers who are just teaching absolute nonsense, this evolution and, and all of these things that we could discuss. But with the Holy Spirit, there's no mistakes. He doesn't tell or, or teach something that uh, could be changed, could be bent, could be altered in any way. Matthew 24, 35, Jesus says that His words will not pass away. Heaven and earth will, but His words absolutely will not. How is it, and be turning to 1 Corinthians 2... How is it that we can know that we have the same book, the same letters, the same words that they had in the first century? Or 1400 years ago, when, or excuse me, 1400 B.C. when Moses 
was writing the, the Pentateuch. How do we know that, that to our children, that our generation after generation after us will read the same things that we're reading? Because He is that teacher of precision. There's no changing it. There's no altering it. It is perfect. 1 Corinthians 2.12 We read through 11 earlier, but then He says this, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, notice, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. There's nothing about men in the involvement of this writing. They penned it, and sure, they were allowed to put their own maybe style and an inflection into those words, but the Spirit told them, in a sense, what to write. It's His teachings. Verse 14, "...the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned." He is a teacher of precision, of perfection. All right, now let's keep going. Let's keep going here. Number three, I know this is very uh, fundamental. Again, I think it's things that we don't always consider about the Spirit. What about this one, though? He loves you. We think about God. God is love. We think about Christ, Christ loving us. We could go to John 3.16, the most uh, quoted, the most commonly known Scripture probably in all of the Bible. For God so loved the world. We could talk about Christ, Ephesians 3.19, the love of Christ that passes understanding. We can't even really fathom the love that Christ has for us. But what about the Spirit? How often do we think about the fact that the Holy Spirit loves us? That He wants what is best for us? That He has made as well for us? Romans 15, 30. You want to read it. 15. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. I think initially, I'm going to go ahead and put another passage here, but when we think about the love of the Spirit, we, we automatically think about the Bible. And sure, because of His love, He gave us the Scriptures so that we can learn and understand and, and be saved absolutely. But it's, it's more than that. Think about, for example, think about Jesus in the wilderness for a moment. Jesus, uh, He's in the wilderness, He's being tempted by Satan, and this is a very critical moment in his life, in his earthly ministry, because he's going to be tempted, and he's, he was always tempted, but here he's going to be tempted specifically in all three facets of temptation. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the, the pride of life. And you remember that the angels ministered unto him, not during it, but after he had successfully resisted those temptations. Right? There, there's no way that we could say that Christ had something that we don't. No, there was no special involvement there. He, of his own fleshly will, chose to resist that temptation. And so because of what we're reading there, we have the ultimate example. We, too, know how to resist temptation, to, to use the Scriptures, to use the text, to, to be able to turn away from what Satan is doing. But rewind for a moment. Why is it that Jesus went into the wilderness to begin with? Who was it that led him there to go through those temptations so that we could read passages like Hebrews 4 and verse 15 and to know that He was without sin. Well, it was the Spirit. Again, we focus on Christ and what He did, and, and rightly so, but don't forget about the fact that it was the Holy Spirit that led Him into the wilderness to be tempted. I, I've told you before, James makes it clear that, that the Lord or, or God does not tempt, but He absolutely does, as He wills, leads us into temptations. That's why Jesus prayed in that prayer, that lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. The Spirit led Him to be tempted. He didn't do the tempting, that was Satan. But the Spirit did that because He loves us. He was willing to take uh, a part of who He is in the Godhead. Again, it's hard to really fathom that, the, the three in one. And He, he took uh, Jesus and led Him there to be tempted so that you and I could follow His example. He loves us, and we need to think about that when we think about the Spirit. Number four, He is good. I, I'm telling you this not because it, it's simple and it's easy. I'm telling you this because the Bible makes it clear. Just like the Bible says that God is good, the whole earth is full of His goodness. Psalm 33 and verse... John 10 and verse 11 himself says, I am the good shepherd. But again, where does the Spirit fit into this? What about the Spirit's goodness? We see it. Uh, Nehemiah 9 and verse 20. 
and he, he's referencing, they're talking about Israel and the, and the time in the wilderness and their sin and, and the manna that was brought about. And he talks about God sending His good spirit to these men, to these women, to these children that He blessed during that time. And of course, uh, another reason I wanted to mention this point is because of Galatians 5.22. It's one of the, the fruits of the Spirit. Love and joy and peace, uh, patience, uh, the, the kindness, the, the goodness, the faithfulness, the, the meekness, the, the temperance, the self-control there, the goodness. And so when I read this book, when I read this Bible given to me by that good Spirit, I learn how to be good as well. I'm not talking about our definition of, of good. I'm talking about God's definition of good. His uh, sense of morality, the only true sense of morality, what is right and, and what is wrong. Let me give you one more point here that, that I think deserves some emphasis. And that is that the Holy Spirit can feel pain. It wasn't too long ago, I, I don't remember the exact lesson, but we were talking a bit about how that the Godhead could be grieved. And I, I want to dive into that a little more for just a moment here because this is so important. You know, we think about heaven, and I don't have all the answers. I don't pretend to. And we know that heaven is a place where God is not going to allow us to feel sorrow. There will be no tears, no, no pain, no hurt. But God Himself, biblically, has shown us that He can feel pain. He can feel disappointment. He can feel hurt. Uh, some examples. Genesis 6 and verse 6, the very beginning. When man disappointed God, He created man and there were... You know, some say, I don't know how they get the number, but some say there were some one million people on earth at this time. I don't know how many there were. But all of them except for eight disappointed God. And He was, he was grieved, Genesis 6.6. 6. He, re he repented Him that He made man. He regretted it in some sense. And it grieved Him at His heart. And when you look at that word grieved, it literally means to feel pain or to feel agony of heart. The, the mind of God, it was hurting. He was disappointed. He was sad in some sense. You see Jesus in the flesh, John eleven thirty five. 35. We know that verse very well, don't we? Jesus wept over the, the death of Lazarus, over the, the people there, the disappointment. Uh, I think about the, the sorrow that He must have felt all through the experience, seeing man and the, the rejection of Him, and not to mention what happened there before and, and during that time on the cross. Sorrow, they can feel that pain. That's also true of the Spirit. Ephesians 4 and verse 30 says that we can grieve the Spirit. It says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. We can grieve Him. We can hurt Him. In fact, Isaiah says we can vex Him. 63 and verse 10 of Isaiah. The Israelites vexed Him. They, they hurt Him. He felt sorrow. He felt pain. But here's the key to this. Here's the application. Why is it that God, that the Son, that Jesus, or that the Spirit would feel pain? And you know the answer. I want to turn to Hebrews 10. This is the last passage I'll take you to. Hebrews chapter 10. Let's begin in verse 28. Hebrews 10 verse 28. Right after, you know Hebrews 10 25, right after a discussion about forsaking the assembly and willful sin in verse 26, he gets to talking about the, the, the reward of that. And I mean that in a negative sense. The just reward. The, the punishment that will occur to those who ascend uh, willfully who reject that sacrifice. Look at verse 28 though. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, right? How much worse a punishment do we deserve? Who hath under this new law, notice, trodden underfoot the Son of God, hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified. These are people who had become Christians, accepted the truth, and now they're rejecting it. Notice, uh, he, he counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. That is a sad, very sad passage to consider. A person that is a child of God still willfully rejects, we, we willfully sin from time to time, and when we do that, especially when we remain in that willful sin, we are literally taking Jesus Christ, who we know, who we understand, and we know what He did, and yet we just almost put Him on the ground and just stomp on Him by our actions, by our, our sin, our willingness to just reject what He did. And at the same token, we're doing despite. There it is again, that vexing Him, that hurting Him, grieving Him. 
it's the closest thing. I don't know that we can really commit the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit uh, the, the way that they did because we don't have the miracles. But this is the closest thing to it today. To, to do despite unto the Spirit of grace. To reject the only thing that we have that can save our souls. Because again, if we reject this, what He gave us... There, there's no hope. This is where I learn about Christ. This is where I learn about God the Father. So if I do despite to Him, and if I reject this teaching by my actions, that, that's it. There's no hope. There's nothing I can do unless, of course, I choose to repent of that. Friends, one of the greatest motivators ought to be for us to reject Satan's temptations, to avoid sin altogether to the best of our ability. One of the greatest motivators ought to be the way that it makes our God feel. The way that it makes... God the Son feel, the way that it makes God the Spirit feel. All that they've done for us, God giving His only Son, Jesus Himself experiencing that crucifixion, becoming a man, and the Holy Spirit doing all that He can to lead Jesus into that temptation for us, to reveal that to us so that we can know about it, and yet we willingly reject it. There may be some here t this morning who have never become a Christian. That's where it begins. You learn from this book how to do that by belief. Believing that Jesus is the Son of God. With repentance, a decision to turn away from sin and to live faithfully to Christ. To give Him everything that you've got. To surrender all to Him. The confession, a decision that with my mouth I'm going to verbally state that I believe that Jesus did just that. That He is the Son of God. That He came to this earth. That He died for me and that I'm going to live for Him. I'm not going to reject Him. I'm not going to be embarrassed or ashamed. I'm going to follow after Him in every way that I can. And to be baptized, to, to be immersed in water for the remission of your sins, the blood of Christ washing those sins away. And, and by the way, the Spirit is involved with that as well, isn't He? John 3 and verse 5, not, not born just of water, but born again of the water and of the Spirit. Again, you, you wouldn't even know. I wouldn't even know about baptism were it not for the Holy Spirit giving us that information. So what are you going to do with it? You know what to do. <clears throat> What's holding you back from becoming a Christian? Maybe you've done that, though, and you have let sin back into your life. You've done despite into the spirit of grace, and we're ashamed of that when we sin and hurt God. But you can make that right if you haven't. You can repent of that, confess it, and we would love to assist you, to pray with you and for you, to encourage you, to do anything that we can uh, to lead you back to, to the right path. We're here for you. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation... Don't grieve the Holy Spirit anymore. Come forward right now, please, as we stand and as we sing together.